Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Everyone else is on YouTube or Facebook watching can you. you nod now. if you can hear me because it's completely silent from where I am. And hi, everyone. You can. Okay, great. So, so today... It's Tisha B'Av, it's the day when we're mourning the loss of the two temples. So how are we going to rebuild the next temple? We, we know that Tisha B'Av was, the temples were destroyed because of baseless hatred. And we have to like find positive love. So we have two temples on the side of our minds, on the side of our heads, on the side of our brains that hold the seat of our minds. And that's where destruction begins. These two temples contain within it our thoughts, our responses, our choices, our actions. Every thought defines how we're going to feel. Our emotions create our emotions, but it all starts here. So I want to talk today about judging favorably because every single day as we walk about our day, we judge people negatively, positively. We look them up and down and we decide, we put them into a box. Are they like us? Are they not like us? So but the Torah's got this intriguing mitzvah. And the mitzvah is that we have to judge. The Torah says you've got to judge your fellow man justly. But the commentary explains, judge your fellow man ju judge, um, justly and you have to judge all of his actions and words only to the good. So I want to say that in here is our ability to make excuses to make the other person look good. Imagine a world where everybody did that. They thought they, they acted, they spoke in certain ways, but you walked around with the mindset inside of these two temples of, my job is to create excuses to make everyone look good. Not only would you have greater positivity, but you would exude that into the rest of the world. So this is 3,000 years ago, before the advent of cognitive psychology. I'm a therapist as well. The Torah came along and recognized that our attitudes, our attitudes, and therefore our words and our actions, because that's what flows from how we think, are formed not by what other people say and do, but it's by the way we interpret what other people say and do. So our attitudes aren't formed by what we see everyone else do. They're formed by the way we interpret that. And that's why I can be standing next to Sarah or Jim or anyone seeing exactly the same thing, hearing exactly the same thing. I can perceive it negatively and they can perceive it positively because it's by the way we interpret. And that happens up here. That happens between our two temples. And we don't want to come from a place of destruction. We want to come from a place of love. So how do we interpret what they do? That comes from our family background, our past relationships, the last movie that we saw, social media, um, the cultural background that we're from is created who we are. Our childhood memories, the insights that we have from that, that's our makeup. But we can modify that. We can change that. But it starts by being aware. So therefore, the Torah says you've got to find and devise a favorable interpretation. Make excuses to make everyone else look good. Now, there are two positions that we can be in ever. <sighs> Position of strength. P for position, O for of, and S for strength, P-O-S, positive. You're smiling. P-O-S, position of strength, you're positive, you're happy, you're smiling, things bounce off you. Or a position, P for position, O for of, W for weakness, a position of weakness. Position of strength or a position of weakness. Position of weakness, P-O-W, you're like a prisoner of war. You're defensive. You hold contempt. You're ready to fight back. You're throwing back the punches all the time. So a position of strength looks like this. My husband can come down in the morning and say, oh, you're wearing that. And I say, yes, I love this top. Isn't it wonderful? Such a nice color. Makes me feel so good. He can come down the next morning same intonation in his voice and say, oh, you're wearing that. Now, if I'm in a position of weakness, I'm defensive, ready to throw a punch. I'm going to say, 
Yes, but I'm leaving the house right now. Is there a problem with that? I don't look good. Does it make me look fat? How's it? What's going? Oh, come on. And I would get angry with the sender because I'm in a position of weakness. Things don't bounce. I'm not happy. So you can, and that's with the boss, with the mother, with the sister, with the sibling, with the partner, with the children. It's all about if I'm in a position of strength or weakness. So how can I change from a position of weakness to strength? Again, it's giving the benefit of the doubt. Um, being able to give the benefit of the doubt and judge favorably. So it means that I get to go through my day creating excuses to make the other person look good. If they're late, if they're late to meet me, oh, they must have got stuck on the on the freeway. Oh, the traffic on the 405, isn't it a nightmare? So what this mitzvah does is it pulls away the rug from under your feet that has this critical condemning uh, attitude that characterizes a lot of our relationships. We don't want it to be that way. Today is a day where we say, let's build awareness. Let's understand what's happening in our thoughts that create discontent in relationship, that create and build resentment. So this mitzvah pulls the rug, judging favorably, Making excuses to make other people look good, it's a mitzvah in the Torah. So the result is we get to create this positive, sympathetic attitude towards others. When we don't think badly about them, we don't speak badly about them, we don't act in vengeful, nasty behaviors about them. So the um, so we're going to practice, okay? I know I can't hear you and I can't see you, so I'm going to leave it to you to come up with your own ideas. And I'll fill in the gap. So let's say there's a, there's a group of women in Jerusalem. By the way, this is only in an Israel story. Group of women in Jerusalem. They meet every single week. And they just come up with scenarios where they can practice making excuses to make the other person look good and doing this mitzvah. They're stellar in the mitzvah of judging favorably. So here's a few examples that I think might work for you. So let's say... You, you're in a group of friends and everyone, someone's, someone's getting married, everyone gets an invite and you don't. Rather than building resentment and being unhappy and ugh, what's going to be and how can they do that? And that's, so, let's make excuses. What do you think? Perhaps it got lost in the mail. Perhaps they had to make a smaller ceremony and they're not as close to you as they are with other people. Perhaps they were meant to get your address and, and then they never got around to it. Perhaps they forgot. Perhaps the list was cut in half by the mother-in-law. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. But when you think this way, it changes the negativity to positivity or at least balance. It takes the edge off. There's another one. Let's say you're, you, you go to a store and Nordstrom. Nordstrom Rack, and you're in the store in Nordstrom Rack, and you're getting up to the counter. There's a long line. You finally get to the counter, and the person behind the counter is just takes you, not giving you eye contact, and she's moody, and she's bringing your products to her with huffs and puffs. And she finally, you finally say, okay, and she says, okay, card, can you put your card in? And she's really showing attitude. So what can you do? You can either move into this, ugh, this woman is disgusting this critical condemning attitude, or you could do the mitzvah of judging favorably. What could happen? Come up with an excuse. Okay, I'm assuming you've come up with something. I'll fill in the gaps. Maybe her dog died. Maybe the woman in front of you at the counter was so rude to her, it put her into a negative space. Maybe her boss just said, this was the last day that she was gonna be working. She has to finish out her shift. Maybe she didn't eat that morning because she couldn't afford it. Maybe she just broke up with her boyfriend. Maybe maybes enable you to act with compassion and love and understanding. And perhaps when you do that, they turn to you and say, oh, thank you for being so nice. I really, I really appreciated you. But it's about the focus on the giving. Let's say you're walking down the street with loads of heavy packages and it starts raining and your friend drives past in a minivan and all the seats are empty. They're all empty. And she doesn't offer a ride. She doesn't even offer you a ride. She doesn't even notice you, but you do get a little bit of eye contact as she drives on. 
what could have happened? Rather than calling up a friend, she just drove past me. Isn't that so rude? I'm here with my bags and it's just started, right? Da, 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 which gives you the attention, makes you the victim. Let's trade that around. How can I make excuses to make her look good? How about she's about to pick up eight people in the eight-seater van? How about she didn't notice you? How about she's only, she has, it's not her car and she's got to rush back to go somewhere. How about she is really sick and doesn't want you in the car to spread germs? And again, it goes on and on. It's your job between these temples for you to act and your thoughts determine the, the experience, the reality of your day. So it's up to you. But it doesn't just stop here. It impacts everyone around you. It impacts all the people, your family, your friends, your, your colleagues at work. When you go in down and frustrated and angry or you go in balanced and calm in a position of strength, not one of weakness. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to give you three strategies in order to do this mitzvah, especially on a day like today where we can judge people favorably give them the benefit of the doubt to exude love with purpose because it's a mitzvah. Strategy number one, it says in Ethics of the Fathers, don't judge your friend until you reach their place. We're never in someone else's place, but don't judge your friends or you can't walk a mile unless you're in someone else's moccasins. That's an American quote. I hope I've got it correct. You can't ever really be in someone else's shoes. So you have to give the benefit of the doubt. If, you know, I heard a story that someone employed a, a guy and the guy was so happy that he started working with this mentor and he gave him everything and he learned from him and he, he doubled his business and he worked and worked and worked. And the guy let him go after a year and a half. And, and he didn't understand what happened. So perhaps if you had his, his mortgage or his size family or his debt or his problems, you would have done the same thing. But we don't know because you're not in the other person's shoes. Maybe you would have done the same thing in that situation. But let's say also the other way around, your employee quits to go and work for your main competitor who might be paying a little bit more. Again, maybe you don't have their debt or their worries or their size family. We can never judge someone unless we're in their shoes. So there was a, a video that went around probably 10 years ago. You can all check it out. It's on YouTube. Just type in get service and, or, you, or on uh, Google and it will come up, get service. So there's this guy and he's walking down the front stairs. He's desperate to get a coffee and to come back to his home office. He's got to work. And the entire video is a, 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 a speech of what's happening inside his head, his internal grumblings, his internal dissatisfaction. And that's what happens. So I want to show you this video. Guy is coming down the stairs and he says, again, inside his mind, oh, I'm, I just need a coffee. I'm so late. Oh, I can't believe this. He gets into the car, puts it into reverse. And as he's backing out, he slams on the brake because there's a kid on the skateboard who's behind his car and he nearly hits him. And he says, oh, where are his parents? Why is never anyone home? This kid's always doing this to me. What's his problem? Where are his parents? He finally gets into the car and he's off and he turns right into a lane of traffic. Why can't the city council deal with this? There need to be more stop signs. There need to be traffic lights. They can't handle this. There's always traffic on this street. They're inept. He finally says, got to get my coffee. And he pulls into the parking lot and there are cars in every space. And he's going up and down. There should be more parking here. They need to acquire more space, more lots. This isn't satisfactory. This is what they're doing to me. Ugh. And he finally finds a space. And just as he's about to pull into it, this red car takes his place. And he gets so angry. And he goes, oh, and a woman gets out the car. And he says, oh, princess of parking, look at her. He finally finds the space, gets out his car, and walks into the, the coffee shop. 
And as he does, there's a line all the way to the back of the door. Why can't they get staff that are quick enough to deal with the people here? The people in the back end, they're not working fast enough. Oh, it's always the same way. Why can't anyone do their job properly? I know how to do it all. He finally gets to the counter and the guy in the green apron says to him, hey, mate, I just want to let you know we're, we're a bit back up, backlogged. And if you take a seat, we'll bring you your order. And he's like, oh, he's looking at his watch. This is ridiculous. Why can't you work fast enough? And all of a sudden, the guy who's just finished his order comes back in and says, oh, mate, can I just have a cookie on that order, please? And the man says, um, hello, am I invisible? You've had your turn. Um, wait your turn again. And the guy behind the counter says, yes, mate, I'll put that on your order. Thank you. And he sits down and he's so unhappy. He's so moody. And all of a sudden, this, this very tall guy in a green suit comes right up to him, right up to this. And he reaches into his pocket as though he's taken a gun out, reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a glasses case and he hands it to him. He's like, oh, what do you want me to do with this? What's going on? And he opens up the case and he puts on these glasses and all of a sudden, everyone he sees has a caption across their chest when he puts these glasses on. And the captions are, what's going on in their life? Because you can never judge someone's strategy one until you're in their shoes, their place. We're told in Pick It Up Us. So the guy who picked up the cookie, all of a sudden he notices he's sitting there with his son. And he says, just lost his job. And he turns around, he sees a woman, it says, fearful of relationships. And all of a sudden, the guy in the green apron coming with his coffee, it says fighting addiction. And just left home two weeks ago as a teenager. There's another struggling with a sense of purpose, struggling with addiction, and he just can't take anymore. So he leaves the coffee shop. And as he leaves it, he he pushes open the door and there's this big curly man in a lumberjack shirt with a big mustache, really strong looking. And it says, just needs a hug. And he turns around because he can't cope and he sees a woman holding two kids. It says working two jobs to support her family. And he continues and continues and he gets in his car with his coffee and he drives home. And everyone he sees in the cars next to him even the person who cuts him up, he sees that they're struggling to get to a job interview because they have so much debt, discontent with life, avoids relationship because of fear of pain. And then he, he sees, before he gets in the car, he sees the princess of parking, remember the red car? And it says grieving the loss of her best friend. So maybe she didn't notice could use a ride, ran away from home three days ago, just got diagnosed with a serious illness. And it goes on, he finally pulls into his home. And as he does, the kid on the skateboard rides past him and his caption says, need someone to care for me. And the guy gets out of his car and he runs over, he goes, hey buddy. And he gets down on his knees and he gives him a high five and the video ends with him having this conversation with this kid and showing him love. So get service. How can we add value to other people's lives? It starts here. It starts with our thoughts of giving the benefit of the doubt, of being in a position of strength and, and judging favorably. So strategy number one is you can't judge someone unless you're in their place. All right, number two, it's a good one. Stop applying a double standard. I say it's good because I'm really good at this or not doing it well. Stop applying a double standard. That means that everything that you get upset with what other people do, half the time you've done it yourself. So around here, where I'm in Pico, and there's a big supermarket called Glatmark. And all the roads around Glatmar are really, really thin. And there's posters everywhere saying, don't honk, um, don't honk your horn because of the neighbors, please keep the noise down. And every now and again, someone will double park. And it's impossible to get around them in order to get into the parking lot. And this is generally what you do when you double park and you see the person still in the car and you're annoyed because you're having a hard time getting around them, you do this. 
and so that they can see that you're upset as you drive past them. But, you know, the other day, and I, I, you know, I hit my horn, you know, the other day, uh, I, this happens to be next door to Glatmart, there's a pharmacy and I needed a prescription. So I just pulled up there, you know, just for a minute and I let my son out the car. There wasn't anyone in front of me at the time or by the side of me, there was no line. And I let him out the car and I said, okay, just go get the prescription. I'll wait for you here. And then people started honking me and making rude gestures in the car. I was like, what's your problem? Why are you doing? I'm not going to leave my son. He's going to come out the pharmacy and see I'm not there. I would never do such a thing. But it's a double standard. Because if I get upset at someone else parking in that place that makes the whole road narrow, I've done it myself. You ever cut someone off on the freeway or you've ever been driving and driving and all of a sudden you see your exit? Oh, it's not intentional, but I've got to veer off to the side quickly. I might cut you off just a little bit. I'm sorry. But if someone does it to you, oh, we're great at making excuses for other people. Uh, sorry, we're great at making excuses for our own behavior and our own action, but to other people, we have a harder time. So you've got to stop applying a double standard. Another um, story I read recently was a woman. She's in a home, her and a hubby. Her hubby is in Israel. Her husband usually sends the kids off to school and uh, he takes them across the road and he goes, okay, you know, like a five-year-old. And he says, off you go, because the younger kids go off to school much earlier in Israel. So this morning, the husband had a meeting, says to his wife, honey, you know, I've got to go. And she says, don't worry, I'll see little, you know, David across the street. He leaves and time comes to take David across the street. So let him walk to school. And she does. OK, we're ready. I'm coming. She takes David across the street. And as he's there, he says, oh, mommy, mommy, please walk me to the corner, please. She's like, oh, well, you know, I've got to get back. Please, can you walk? Sure. He walks, a, he walk, she walks David to the corner. And then David says, please, can you just, just walk me to my school? She's just here. I love, please, 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 please. Fine, fine. Okay, but I've got to get back. No, please, please. She walks him into the school. Can you just take me into my classroom? Oh, I really, really would love that, love that. Fine. She takes little David into the classroom. And when she gets there, there's no teacher absolutely no supervision and there's 25 kids completely alone anything could have happened so she leaves the school after setting him in place she calls the principal straight away i just dropped my kid off there's no supervision there's no one there dumb that night her husband comes in and david says mommy took me into my classroom today not just across the street it was so awesome and the husband looks at his wife and says, honey, who was looking after the baby? Who was looking after the other kids? And she went, oh, and, you know, it wasn't meant to be. It was just a second. I only left them for a second. So stop applying a double standard. Make excuses, not only for yourself, but also for other people. Number three. So, so far we've got you can't judge someone till you're in their place. Number two is stop applying a double standard. And number three is admit you don't know the whole story. You step into chapter two half the time and you have no idea what's happened before you. And you're jumping in, making all these assumptions about people. So there was a, a slew of videos, like commercials that came out for AmeriQuest Financial Services, which is a mortgage company. And they had a slogan. And the slogan was, don't judge too quickly. We won't. Right. So meaning if you come here, I'm going to give you a mortgage money. Alex, I'll, I'll give you your loan. Don't worry. Don't judge too quickly. We won't. So I'll tell you a few of the stories. You can check them out also on YouTube. So there was a, a guy. He's walking his cute little doggy. And there's a grandmother and a granddaughter. The grandmother's you know, taking a nice stroll with the granddaughter. Moments before the the man who's walking the dog is eating a really yummy chocolate bar and he drops it and it lands right between the dog's legs at that point the grandmother points out oh look look at the cute doggy sweetheart and at the same time the the man who's walking the dog he bends down and he picks up the chocolate bar right between the dog's legs and goes 
At which point the grandmother goes, oh! on the go on the granddaughter's legs. It could be, but don't judge too quick. It's not always what it seems. Another story is there's a man lying in a hospital bed and there's a an elevator coming up that enters the bedroom with the mother and the daughter holding a balloon saying, get well soon, daddy. And there's an intern there and a doctor there and 12:15. Oh, there's an intern and a doctor there. And at that very moment, there's a fly going round and round the body of the sleeping father. And the doctor picks up the defibrillator in two hands and he's going, and he gets the fly. And he says, as the mother and daughter walk into the room, I've killed them. I've killed him. Don't judge too quick. It's not always what it seems. So instead of jumping to conclusions, you, you always know where your hands are, but you don't always know where your mind is. And this is what we need to work on today and every day in order to judge favorably and create a beautiful world, build a beautiful world. So I, I want to finish by explaining that if you always, you, you're not stealing anything, but your minds, your imagination grabs a hold of your thinking and creates these amazing scenarios about people. Um, my neighbors across the street, they're drug dealers before marijuana was legalized. They're drug dealers. Why? Because cars would arrive and they would have little boxes that would be loaded into cars. Off they would go. Always drivers coming and going. And one night I went out into the street and it was as though the, our entire street was a massive bong filled with smoke. I called my husband out to come and have a check it out. So they were drug dealers. But we, got, we became friends with them. They had a hat business. So your mind always looks around at people and decides exactly who they are, how they're dressed, the way they're acting. And it all comes from the way you interpret their actions and their words and what they do. So you have an opportunity today and every day to take that critical condemning nature of yourself and turn it into one of positivity and love and balance and giving by creating excuses to make the other person look good. So a quick recap. We understood cognitive psychology came along way before, um, Torah came along way before cognitive psychology to say our job is to judge everyone, everyone justly and interpret their words and actions only to the good. So we have a position of strength and a position of weakness. Position of strength is P-O-S, your positive. Position of weakness, P-O-W, your defensive. You get to check yourself. Anytime I'm being defensive, how do I move? Give the benefit of the doubt. Judge favorably everything that's happening. Three strategies. Number one, you can't judge someone till they're in their place. Number two, you have to recognize that you're living by a double standard many times. And number three is don't judge too quick. It's not always what it seems. You don't know the whole story. You've only stepped into chapter, you know, the middle chapter. And lastly, Check yourself. You know where your hands are, but your mind goes off creating with your imagination, grabbing hold of your thinking, all these amazing fanciful ideas that you need to rein it back in. Create excuses to make other people look good. And we can start building the third temple through love and giving one brick at a time. Thank you for listening.